Durango City Council 2019 Candidates Forum, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of La Plata County. My name is Missy Rohde, and I will be the moderator this evening. The City of Durango's regular municipal election will be held on Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019, and will be conducted by mail. There are two purposes for this election. The first is to elect two city council members to four-year terms. The second part of the ballot is to decide question 1A, which is to decide the authorization to increase city taxes for 10 years for the purpose of funding street maintenance. And that's the portion that we will be discussing later. All persons who have attained the age of 18 who live within the boundaries of the city of Durango and are U.S. citizens, and who are registered active voters on March 13, 2019, according to the records of the La Plata County Clerk, will be mailed ballots on March 16th. So watch for those in the mail. The program tonight, as I've said, will be divided into two corresponding parts. During the first portion, we will hear from the Durango City Councilor candidates. The second portion uh, will be dedicated to question 1A, ballot issue, uh, and supporter and, a and um, an opponent will pro provide comments um, about the, the question, the ballot question. There will be a very short two-minute break between these two parts of our forum so that we can allow folks to move from one position to another. I want to thank you again for joining us tonight, thank the City of Durango for allowing us to use the chambers this evening, and a special thank you to Durango Government Television for um, televising and recording this session. They always do a wonderful job and are very much appreciated. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that is committed to making democracy work. It encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Participating in and hosting forums such as this one is just one of the many activities that the League engages in to uh, accomplish the mission. The League does not support or oppose candidates or political parties, but we do support or oppose issues that do or do not agree with our state and national positions. The League of Women Voters of La Plata County does not have a position on the local 2019 ballot issue, question 1A. For more information about the League, membership in the League, which is not for women only, and this election, you can visit our website, which is www.lwblaplata.org. A little bit about city council. All five city council members serve the community at large and thus do not represent specific wards or precincts. The city mayor position is rotated and is recognized as the head of city government. He or she presides at all meetings, but has no regular administrative duties and has no power of veto. The city council makes policy and legislative decisions for the city of Durango. It appoints the city manager, who is responsible for managing the business of the city. The council evaluates the city manager's performance annually. Four candidates are running for two open Durango City Council seats. They are, according to their position on the ballot, Marcos Wisner, Jamie McMillan, Barbara Noseworthy, and Kim Baxter. The format for the candidate forum this evening will be that each candidate will have two minutes for opening statements, one minute to respond to each question submitted by the audience, and one minute for closing statement. A word about timing to the candidates. Um, Deb Riddell, 
here is our timekeeper, and she will hold up paddles when you have one minute remaining in your time, when 30 seconds remain, and a big red stop. I don't, well, do you want 15 seconds? Okay, nice. we'll do 15 seconds also, and then a big red stop. And when the stop comes up, if you would please conclude the sentence that you're on, and uh, as kind of quickly as you can, uh, so we can move on to the next candidate. So candidates should answer questions by clearly stating their positions, and please stay on point. To begin our forum, each will have two minutes to tell you about him or herself. And we will begin with Barbara Noseworthy as a result of the draw. So Barbara, if you would like to start. Thank you. Thank you, League of Women Voters, and thank you for coming out. And good evening, and my name is Barbara Noseworthy. I discovered, my husband and I discovered Durango uh, a relatively short time ago in 2014. We were hiking the Colorado Trail. We came here at the beginning and said, oh my goodness, this is an incredible place. Maybe we should live here for six months and see if it's a place we want to live forever. We finished the trail. We took the trolley downtown. We walked into a real estate agent, and I'm sure they thought, yeah, right. And a month later, we had purchased our place to live. It was an intentional move because we saw an engaged community um, and a, a vibrant community with a distinguished um, past. Fast forward, I'm now running for city council, and I recognize that I have the least amount of time here of anyone on the council. So I think about what is it that I want and what is it I can bring to, to this effort. I lived in the West in 1981, and I moved out there to Casper, Wyoming with $100 and no job. And I had to leave. I couldn't stay there as much as I liked it. And my work took me all over the world. So I have, uh, my work is taking me for working in big organizations, complex organizations, rural villages, dealing with big budgets, personnel, and making difficult choices and prioritizing. And I look at all of that and I bring that and think, I can also bring that to bear in this community. So I am running for city council because I care about this community. I want to see a future for Durango as distinguished as its past. And I'd also like to recognize everyone else who's gone before me and served on city council. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Kim? Thank you. And thank you, League of Women Voters and everyone who's here. Um, I came to Durango in the 90s to look at it. And I came back again in the 2000s to look at it because it had this great attraction to me. And when I decided to move here, it was because of the character of our community. And I lived up in the Crestview subdivision, and that character was very evident there, as it is in all of our neighborhoods in town. And that character to me means a multi-generational community where we have our children, families, we have the college students, we have our seniors, we have our grandparents all living here. I am afraid that we're um, being challenged in that model, so I would really like to see the, um, that character continue forward into the future, and there's several ways to do that. That's by um, providing good paying jobs, encouraging economic development here, and it's by having available housing for all income levels so that people can return here, they can move here, they can stay here, they can be here. Uh, my background is in finance. I've been in the hotel business for over 20 years, and now I'm um, a small business owner and have been doing that for over 20 years. I grow walnuts with my sister, and I also grow fruit trees with my husband. I adore it. I love doing that. I've been on the Natural Lands Board. I've been on the Multimodal Board. I'm currently on the Planning Commission. I've attended over 250 city meetings in the time that I've been here, and <clears throat> more than you can imagine since June. <laughs> so um, I also volunteer for Adaptive Sports, and I am a judge at the Regional Science Fair and an appraiser at Destination Imagination. So my husband and I are very, very involved in the community and care about the character. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Jamie? Thank you. And thank you, League of Women Voters. Uh, my name is Jamie McMillan. Um, I'm not getting married today. I just want to look nice. Um, but as you can tell, I'm, I'm, my background is uh, probably, if you know, financial advisor. I may have met some of you in the community before. But uh, this is my ninth year in Durango. So when I came out the first time, I left uh, the big state of California, I'm sure we all love. 
um, and wanted to be a local financial advisor in a small town. And the one thing that struck me when I came here, I thought was just the right word was unique. I had not seen anything like this anywhere in the country. And I think that's something very special. Now, running for city council, one thing that I wanted to touch on real quickly is there's three characteristics I saw in the municipal guy that makes a good council member. Um, the first one is being a good decision maker. And I think in my profession, I have a lot of time I, I spend separating people from their money to make investments for their long term. So that takes a lot of work and a lot of forecasting. I think I'm pretty good at that. I think the last, uh, second thing rather is you have to be critical. Uh, we as council members should debate and have constructive criticism and I think that's good and healthy for any democracy. I'd like to see more of that happen and especially with the public's input as well. And lastly, I think the council job, especially today in the economic environment we're in, you need someone that can be a public relations officer. Go out and talk to companies, bring in people that, that want to create jobs in the city. Uh, that's what I do best. I get on conference calls, not afraid to talk to people. Um, and I think I have the experience and background to do that. It can make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> all okay, right. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Marcos Wisner. Thank you all again for uh, hosting this event and uh, televising it to, you know, the rest of Durango. I think not enough people are able to show up to these sort of things. So it's a, a great opportunity for me and I think the rest of us to share our share our platform, share our goals for this uh, councilship position. Um, I'm born and raised here. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up here. Uh, not only that, but I'd had the, I had the opportunity to leave for eight years. Uh, I trained as a chef in some of the world's best restaurants. And I came back. I came back because I love this town. I came back because there's so much potential and there's so much love and so much support that I found through this community. So I came back. I started a business, 11th Street Station. It definitely took me through the turmoils of, you know, just business ownership altogether. But what I gained from it was the potential, like I said, the potential this town has to has for us. Um, I'm, I'm doing this because I have a vested interest, uh, as do several of you, the rest of you, uh, for the future and prosperity of our beautiful town, Durango. Uh, I'm here to champion small business. I'm here to promote. Uh, recreational diversity. I'm here to provide a long-term vision and proactive solution for our city leadership. Through this, I know we can become an inclusive and diverse community that supports all the individuals that make this town amazing. I, mo <clears throat> I moved back to Durango for my family, the mountains, and this community. And I intend to protect the three of these things if I get elected to city council. So with that, um, you know, I look forward to the questions you all have to ask tonight. Great. Good segue. Um, we start with the first question. What is the biggest issue facing Durango and what can city council do? And we will start with Marcos. Um, what I've identified as the biggest problem for this, uh, for our city council, I think, I, I believe it's our long-term vision and leadership as far as implementing safety nets and uh, budgetary uh, uh, capital invest, you know, to, to protect our long-term term infrastructure such as our roads. Uh, you know, a perfect example is our water, our sewer treatment plan. I think that's a situation to where we should have been planning ahead for that much farther ahead of time to where we wouldn't find ourselves making the quick, harsh uh, decisions that we couldn't get the full, you know, I still feel like the community isn't fully on board with the decision to locate it there, or even the, the, the decision to go about it the way that we did. So I think that's the perfect example of why we could just plan better and, and, and have more vision for our community. Thank you. Same question, Jamie. I think it's the economy. I think Marco's right. Uh, the, the global, well, the national economy is at basically full employment, somewhere around 3.9%. Uh, but if you study the revenues we have coming in from the city, I, number one, I don't think they're diverse enough. Um, and secondly, I don't think we're emphasizing some areas that are growing. If you look at some of the, the retail uh, sector, that's slightly up from year over year. Uh, you look at the uh, uh, other numbers coming in from, say, autos are pretty flat. But I think we need to identify businesses and try to do all we can in terms of keeping taxes down and reducing fees 
particularly on licensing and things like that, so we can reinvigorate our economy, particularly around, uh, especially North Maine, I see opportunity as well. Kim. Thank you. I think the key to Durango's economic viability and sustainability over the long term is the health of Durango's tax base. And Durango's tax base is based upon the amount of money that each and every one of us have left at the end of the day after paying our mortgages, paying city service fees, paying health care insurance, health care costs, to spend on the things that we want to buy, like clothing and food. That's where Durango's revenue comes from. That's where the health of our community comes from. So in order to have a better, more uh, viable tax base, what we need to be doing is working on economic development and housing that people can afford so that they have more money to spend on the things that they want to spend it on and enjoy doing the things that they want to do, as well as then providing the city with the dollars that they need in order to provide the basic services that they provide out of the general fund for our community. Thank you. Thank you. And Barbara. I think that there are some uh, big immediate issues and long-term issues facing the city. The big immediate issue is dealing with our deferred maintenance, not only from our streets, but from facilities, uh, other buildings. Um, so addressing that, but then also looking at the long-term financial health of the community and what are the issues, what are the capital projects coming down the road, and really getting the community buy-in and understanding around that. And I think it has to also be done in a manner that welcomes differing views and differences of opinions, because I think when we do it in that that way, we actually come up with a better solution. Thank you. The next question is, what needs to be approved regarding city management, and what will you bring to city, city council to see these changes implemented? And we will start with Kim. If you look at the organizational structure of, of Durango's government, the citizens and residents of our town are A number one, <laughs> to steal a phrase. Um, <laughs> then the city council is responsible to those citizens and residences, residents, and they, the city council is responsible for directing city staff on how to manage the city. Currently, I don't, um, currently, City Council does not take as uh, strong a role as I would like to see taken in the, manage, in the directing of the city staff to manage the city, and I believe that that's where um, the responsibility lies, that's where the priorities get set, and that's where the direction gets given from. So City Council is responsible for that, and I would definitely step up and do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Barbara? Uh, I also believe that the uh, City Council is responsible to its constituents, and that, that re involves also listening to your constituents, meeting with them, and having um, uh, robust and respectful discussions. I believe that the advisory boards, as you look on the org chart, report to the City Council, and that's something I'd like to see strengthen, those advisory boards coming. Um, more directly to the city council rather than through staff suggestions and recommendations. And again, the city council is responsible for the hiring and firing of three positions, the city manager, the city attorney, and the judge. And that's a, a deep responsibility we have to all take seriously. Um, and again, I come back with what I would be doing is being accessible and uh, willing to listen to and look at differing views because I learn every time I, I hear a, something I don't quite necessarily understand or agree with. And um, Marcos. Um, I, I think what I'd like to see is, I think we've all kind of touched on it a bit, is, is uh, the, the, the council's involvement with our staff and not just the council's involvement, it's the, the council's there for the community. We're there to listen to the community, to take their input and translate them appropriately to our staff to, to where they can accommodate their suggestions. I don't want to just be a voice for, you know, the, the individuals that, you know, show up to city council as much as I'd like to see more people show up to these, you know, sort of forums and, and things of that nature. But being a business owner, being active with a business like 11th Street Station, I talk to several people on a day-to-day -day basis. I have the pulse of this town uh, and, and a lot of people that just really do want to be heard but don't have necessarily the... Um, 
strength or, or, or willingness to, to put themselves at, at the podium here in front of council. So I'd like to be a voice for those individuals and do my best to be involved with our city staff to uh, be a voice for that uh, demographic and constituents. Thank you. Here's the next question. Oh, uh, Jamie. Jamie. Oh, Jamie, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. I got a couple things to say. Yes, of course you do. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's unique. You know, this is a home rule uh, operation, right? So there's, there's, there's different municipalities by statute. Uh, ours has been around since 1912. It's the closest form of government to the people. Um, but I hearken back to my days in the Marine Corps. You know, I was an enlisted guy. I had to take orders from officers. I didn't always like them sometimes, but I still had to take orders from them. Uh, you elect the council to be the decisions and policy making for the town. I look at the city staff as executing those orders. So I like to review the city staff uh, at all levels and all in the budget. Um, I only ask for them to pull their weight as hard as I do every day in the private sector. And uh, I think those will be some good discussions to have if I'm elected. Uh, but I will close with this. I know they work hard. I went out with the, many of them to visit some tours, the police station and other areas, and they, and they definitely put in a lot of hard work. Uh, so we have to recognize that as well. But uh, we are definitely the elected officials, and we will set policy and guide the city. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, now on to the next question. I apologize for that. Ten years ago, we had budget surpluses. Since then, there has been a loss of the public trust, especially when people are told there is no money for roads. And the next week, we read in the paper about a plan to restripe College Drive to the tune of $2 million. Well, what, will you, what will you do differently to restore trust and jumpstart economic development? Okay, and we will start with Barbara. First of all, I think you have to start with the budget. Um, and it's a 372 page budget, and there's some issues around that. And so I look at, um, and there, you know, you've got your GASBY, GASBY for reporting requirements. But I also think that if you reinstate the long term financial planning, uh, committee that reports to the city council, you can start to look at saying these are the things we're thinking about, these are the discussions, and you can have a regular budget discussion. You could even develop a shorter budget that's easily accessible. So restoring trust in that is um, also about being as transparent as possible and as accountable as possible. These are our dollars. This is what we're doing with it. When we don't use these dollars, this is what happens to them. Uh, it's also about distinguishing between what's in the budget as a whole and what's in the budget with the general fund, because I think that's the money where the flexible dollars are, and that's what we need to be particularly concerned about how we use those resources. Marcus? Um, yeah, so it's a, it's, it, it, it's a difficult situation we find ourselves in. Um, I do feel that, I, I know that we, <laughs> it's a tough question. Um, so the, the reason we found ourselves in this position, it's the first question you'd asked, which is what's the number one problem for Drink? And what it is, is it's the lack of foresight. We're, we need more long-term vision. We need to set goals for ourselves and we need to set aside budgets to where we won't find ourselves in these budgetary constraints, to where we won't find ourselves trying to fill potholes up that should, you know, and, and repair roads and set aside money for those roads and safety nets that we should have been, you know, planning for and building up years, years back. Um, these are things that every city needs. This is something that has to keep the city operating. And what's unfortunate is that we've found ourselves in a predicament to where we do need to make some quick decisions to resolve these issues before we start taking from the services that really do need our town and need our support. Thank you. Um, Jamie. Was it first plunder assumes a softer name of revenue? Thomas Paine. So I'm, I'm not quite sure the argument the city's making that the last um, 10 years that we can still blame that on the recession. We have fourfold at the Dow Industrial Average since 6,000 was the low, now we're at 26,000. I'm just curious where all this revenue is going. Um, 
that being said, they have discussed, I've sat down, and they do do budget cuts, and that'll probably be the first discussion. But I think the big thing we can do is kickstart the revenue. And I think that really goes down to the focus of where it's coming from. I'll mention this because I don't have much time. There's only one industry growing faster than anything in the world, and it's pot. So uh, we have to treat our retail dispensaries as, as best we can. We have to give them some leeway to grow. And I'm also asking the council, uh, rather city attorney, to start looking into uh, cannabis hospitality lounges, which the state already has a bill on the legislative desk uh, uh, in Denver, and I think the governor will sign that. We have to create new experiences. Hi. Um, as with all things financial, there's two, uh, two main aspects, revenue and expenses. And I think all of us, when we're faced with a challenge in our, uh, the cost of our living and the affordability of a place we live, we look to how do we decrease our expenses? How do we be more effective and more efficient in doing what we do? And I think the city is going to have to take a closer look at that. How to make every department more effective and more efficient and make their capital budget projects um, not have overruns come in on time and be done the way that we expect them to be done. The other area is revenue generation and uh, that tax base we were talking about with the good jobs and the available housing is one good way to do it. It's also expanding uh, the visitors from the county and our region to come here and shop, invite them, make them welcome. Um, and there are other things that we can look at like currently right now the city does not um, receive city sales tax on internet sales. We, we need to um, pursue that with vigor and bring that into our coffers. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question, are you in favor of or opposed to question 1A and why? And we will start with Jamie. I'm, I'm definitely opposed to it. Uh, it. It's taxation by gradualism, basically. I mean, I think that the argument from the supporters, and they have, that's a tougher thing to do is raise taxes. I understand that, so I have to strengthen my argument. But they noted that the 2.9% is the lowest in the state and 11.2 is the highest. Right now, at 7.9, if we go to 8.4, we're within about, well, 79, 90% maybe range of, of Boulder. So uh, we're not like a unique ski town. We have diverse economy. I think we can find that uh, funding from the budget. I think we need to be patient, let the economy continue to grow, and let's uh, focus this, and I think we can actually direct it to something of more immediate uh, need, and I'm more supportive of the police station, and I have some ideas on how we fund that for about probably 20% of the cost of this tax increase. Kim. <clears throat> If 1A passes, it will address um, some pressures on city finances, about 25% of the current <clears throat> reported needs. So um, I'm not advocating against 1A, but I believe that we didn't listen well enough to our community and explore well enough the options that could have been used to also do that. This may not have been the best choice at this time, and I don't think that those conversations were robust enough to determine that. Um, However, oh, thank you. Um, however, there are multiple other options that could have been used and um, holding expenses at a zero increase for a number of years would have been one way to put some money in the general fund. And there were many other options that were submitted by citizens but were not really taken seriously. So I would like to see those kind of conversations happen. And in the future, a sales tax increase may actually be needed, but I don't want to see one for the police department. I don't want to see one for the waste, uh, for the water treatment system, for the stormwater waste management system. I don't want to see sales tax increase after sales tax increase after sales tax increase. Thank you. Marcos. Um, I'm for 1A. Uh, it's, it's not my campaign, but it's something that, like I said, I think it, I, I agree with Kim. Yeah, it's unfortunate we have to take this measure to address our potholes, to address our streets, to address the way we get our way around. When I look at the scope of the rest of Colorado and towns of our same size, same economic scale, we fall in the, we don't fall, we, we can afford to take this tax increase. Gunnison's at 8.4, Crested Butte's at 8.9, Silverton's at 10.4%. So we can afford to take this. And what's, by, ta by going for the sales tax, what we're doing is we're able to disperse it amongst the whole community to take just a little bit. If you spend $500 on groceries, 
it's only, I think, I don't know, like a, five, like a $10 increase in your groceries. It's not significant enough. But if we do not pass 1A, we're going to have to do some quick, fast decisions, and we're going to have to cut budgets from the programs that we really need, the individuals that truly need them here in Durango. Uh, things like the library, things um, service-focused, that that's what's going to go. And Barbara. At this time, I do not support 1A. I do not believe that we have engaged the community and explored the various uh, proposals that very others have put before us as ideas. Um, I was here at the study session when Melissa Youssef said, maybe we should slow down a bit, engage more, learn from a 20 point difference in the 2000, in the November election, and really get a deeper engagement. I've had a, a letter that I suggested to the community and to the city councils that we address five questions. And with that understanding, we might have a better understanding of the issues. Why is our budget larger, as large as it is compared to others? And there should be a reason for that. How did we get to this situation where we don't have our streets maintained? What did we have to prioritize to do that, to take care of it? What have we cut from the budget thus far? What are the trade-offs that we will have to address if we don't raise taxes? And that, those will come with dollar amounts. And what are the future capital and maintenance projects coming down the pike? And how do we propose paying for that? I think we have to have that deep discussion and look at the trade-offs and suggestions. And I'd like to suggest that that's something we can, you know, we often compare ourselves to Golden. Two things, Golden has a 7.5% sales tax, and Golden engaged in a deep uh, engagement process with citizens uh, on a panel to come up with those recommendations over a period of several months. Thank you. Um, the next question is, regardless of how the question 1A vote to increase sales tax turns out, would it be wise for city councilors to take active leadership and I believe the word is taming, um, parks and recreation and open space costs, I believe it is, um, costs overruns and scope of pacing of projects. Uh, we'll start with Jamie. Uh, I, I, I think the voters will was already said for tax increases for parks. Uh, I've tried to look statutorily or anywhere in the city charter that we can move money around. Um, one thing I noticed that came up lately was about an easement with the railroad on the Oxbow Trail was might not going to be funded because it was eminent domain. So that's an $8 million. Well, that's a lot of money for how much more trail we put together. So I may not agree with it, but the taxpayers that voted for it. I'm more focused on growing the revenue. One thing I want to do is focus on that by proposing already or try to in 2020 with other council members, we suspend all licensing fees for new businesses in 2020. That's an equivalent of a grant to the kickstart a, a new company, a new employer. We already have birds, 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 and some areas on North Main that had benefited from some of these grants and small thousands of dollars that the city has given. And we need uh, rather uh, increased revenue also from other sources, I think, and that includes Airbnb being available to anyone in the city to make money from leasing out their place if it's owner occupied. I think it's a great way to put money in the pocket and back in the community. Thank you. And Kim? Our Parks and Rec Department has contributed immensely to the quality of life that we all share in this area. And it brings other people here and it's an economic driver for us. However, we, the Parks and Rec is currently subsidized, not subsidized, I'm sorry, they're, um, the dedicated sales tax goes to Parks and Rec's open space and some to multimodal. Um, that is a sales tax that will uh, sunset in 16 years. We need to take a really good, hard look at the capital projects that we're doing and the capital projects we've done and the operation and maintenance expenses associated with those two. Because those operating and maintenance expenses are what's going to be the most difficult thing for the Parks and Recs Department to actually sustain, especially if that tax sunsets. A 16-year-old person, uh, a child born today when they are 16 years old, if we don't figure that out, the doors to the rec center will be closed. Thank you. 
Barbara? The Parks and Rec system here is a wonderful resource. And uh, I'll agree with Kim, people come here and it's a part of a calling card. And my issue is making certain that we maintain what we have right now. We've got great facilities, but I wanna make certain that we've got deferred maintenance taken care of and future uh, maintenance looked at and we know what's coming down the pike. So when I look at issues, when you talk about taming, I look at issues like, should we really build a bridge over 32nd Street or maybe take care of the maintenance issues of the Animas River Trail? Because I look at those and I say, some of the frost heaves are a potential, it's an accident waiting to happen. So I wanna make certain that we are very thoughtful and I think that that's a part of the sales tax issue that we should be maintaining what we have been building um, and it can, you have to keep it in balance. Not everything new, but keeping everything up to speed so that 10 years from now, we're not fundraising for a new roof for the rec center. And Marcos? Um, no, I think this is a great question. Uh, so with, with 1A, this is why we should vote for 1A. Is, is the last thing we want to resort to is pulling from our parks and rec fund. Not only is that, it's, it's only half, it's not even, it's half the money that we need to do the street improvements we do. So we're still, you know, gonna have to take money from other places. But not only that, it's, it's um, we need to listen to our voters from 2015 and we need to understand that we prioritize our money towards parks and recs because this is our crown jewel. This is what makes Durango special. And not only that, but we risk a lot of these grand opportunities by disturbing those parks and recs agendas. If we go in and we start repositioning that money and taking away from those things, we're gonna lose millions of dollars in grants from open outdoor space and all those programs. So that's the last, if anything, what I would like to see happen with parks and rec is a prioritization of their projects to make sure we're doing things that are economically beneficial to the hand that feeds them, which would be the sales tax and feeding our downtown. Thank you. Um, the next question is understanding a current, oh, I understand that a current council member has recommended a kind of citizen advisory board to review the budget. Um, are you in favor of this? Why or why not? If in favor, how will board members be selected? By whom? To whom will they report? And what authority will they have? And we will start with Kim. Thank you. <clears throat> I believe that a finance committee that is long term is essential to the city council's ability to manage the city and to give direction to city staff. But I see that finance committee as a long term revenue generator, economic generator, and something that a uh, committee that takes into effect, into account all our expenses down the road. And we're looking 15 to 20 to 25 years out. The current proposal is a committee that advises the um, city manager on what happens with the budget over the coming year. It's not a long-term conversation. It's not taking into account long-term issues. I believe it needs to report to the city council and advise the city council so that the city council has more than one data point for making decisions because currently the data point comes from staff. Thank you. Um, Marcos? Um. You know, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with something like a citizen's finance committee. I think, uh, yeah, we are, I think as a community, we are wondering why we find ourselves in this position of why can't, why don't we have money for our streets? Okay, as far as a citizen's finance committee, what I'd like to do is, is look into how those programs have benefited other communities and other city councils and led them in the direction to uh, actually bring their budgets under control and actually take care of their finances. <laughs> If, they, if we were to address something like a citizen's finance committee, I'd definitely want to be involved. I'd want to uh, hear their input and, and understand and, and just be, I guess, be heavily involved in the criteria that we go through in selecting these individuals to make sure that they have the true intentions of what's best for our town and what's best for our community to grow and deal with our financing, finance budget to where it doesn't get out of hand. Okay, thank you. Barbara? Durango used to have a financial advisory board. 
and then it was dis uh, disbanded. I, I don't know why, but it uh, doesn't exist now. So I firmly believe we need to pull back a financial advisory board, and it does need to have a long-term focus. As to the how they would be selected, I think that has to be fully by the, uh, the city council. You will want people with, uh, certainly with credentials, financial credentials, but you'll also want the engaged citizen because you never know where a good question or a good thought is gonna come from. The engaged citizen who may not have the same financial background as a CPA or something along that line. And then um, the authority they need to have is they're an appointed body. So they, um, they can make recommendations, but ultimately it is the city council's re uh, responsibility to make tough decisions about budget, to make tough decisions about um, what programs go forward, what programs get prioritized, uh, including uh, everything from parks and rec to police station issues along that line. Thank you. Thank you. And Jane. No, we don't need another committee. Um, you just get further away from the people uh, when you develop layers and layers of, of organizations and other people. We've got an architect who's on the council now. We have our mayor pro tem has an accounting background for 30 years. You balance budgets, you run a business, I run a business. I don't think we need a committee to do that. If you're going to have that leadership, that's what you elect. People that have financial experience if you think that's what's important. So I don't agree with that. I'd rather do something more interesting like a business growth advisory board, uh, both for the south of Durango, the central and north Maine, and that uh, we work on trying to find ways in every way possible to grow the economy here with some stakeholders, the risk takers. That's what revenue is. It comes from those taxes collected by sales. If we don't get the revenue, we don't grow the sales of this town, it's gonna stay anemic, one to 2% per year, and I wanna target 5% per year. So let's not waste time with another committee. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question, the current city council has made sustainability and climate protection one of its top five priorities. Do you favor continuation of this priority? Why or why not? And we'll start with Barbara. Absolutely. I think the work that the city council has done in recent years to address sustainability is vital. We recognize that we have a changing climate, that our summers are going to be hotter and drier and more uh, prone to fires, that our winters are shorter. Uh, part of my platform is taking that sustainability plan and putting it with accountable goals, which I know they have, but looking at accountable, measurable goals with dollars to support those activities, particularly in the areas of fire mitigation, renewable energy, the air we breathe, and potential diminishing water supply. We're in the 19th year of a drought of which only four years have been above average. 19 years of reduced water supply. Okay. Um, Jamie? The, uh, you know, the stock market, I think Warren Buffett has a saying that's kind of interesting. He says, stock forecasters make soothsayers look like geniuses. Uh, I can't predict what the weather's gonna do. What I do know is the ideas, whether in renewable for wind or electric, um, those rise to the top of the heap if they're successful and they're good. I mean, look at EV vehicles right now. They're only one to 2% of the market. So already the biggest player in the electric car market is saying, I can't sell cars for $75,000 a year. I have to make a $30,000 uh, a car a year. So I think subsidies are fine for renewable energy. We do a really good job of that in Colorado from what I could see from our senators and our Congress people. Uh, I have no objection to any energy source that will make us efficient um, and secure. And I think that's my uh, sort of global view on climate change. Okay. <clears throat> um, Marcos? Um. Yeah, it's kind of a funny question. I think it'd be funny to see who would be opposed to, um, you know, being more sustainable, doing, creating renewable energy sources, things of that nature. What I do see for our city and what I do see that we need to plan for are, you know, some, some simple things. Our water treatment f facility, for example, um, is under, you know, it's, it's, it's a volatile space. It's something that definitely 
Uh, you know, if, if, if it doesn't work, then what, what do we have to fall back on? We need to look at that second treatment facility to provide security for our community to actually, you know, deal in the situation in the worst case scenario. Um, I think, you know, being even to the smaller things, when we look at something like, you know, the bear problem and why are bears here in our town? Well, let's look at why there was a freeze two years ago in April that froze all the blossoms on our trees. There was no fruit. Our, t our town should have recognized that happening and educated our community to do bear locked trash cans, things like that. But it, it goes every way. I'm for it. It just makes sense. I'm a millennial. Okay, this is our last <laughs> question. Oh, Kim. <laughs> uh, Sorry that's about okay. that. That's all right. Um, sustainability is very important. Our, our environment's very important. Our river is very important. It's not only um, an economic uh, advantage for us, but it's also what uh, gives us our life and our breath, and it feeds all our plants, and it feeds our, our people. Um, but I see two, two things here. I see a city that has programs for sustainability, which is fabulous, and we need to have those, and we need to have measurements, we need to know how we're doing. But we also have a larger city, and that's our whole community. That's all the people who live in it. It's not the city as the business, it's the city as the community. And our community also needs to step up and take responsibility for what goes on in the community, how much trash we throw away, how, we, how much water we use, um, how much energy we use. Currently, if you're reading the news, we're finding that we can no longer have a place to take recyclables and they're ending up in the trash. So we need to do some forward thinking about how to make those kind of changes. And we have several advocacy, advocacy groups in this area that can help us making those decisions and advise us on that. Okay, thank you. So this is the last question we'll um, have time for tonight. As a city councilor, do you anticipate any conflicts of interest? If so, how would you handle it? And we will start with Jamie. I knew I'd get that question. Um, I actually, I invest in pot, as you can tell. I'm a money manager, so um, I would have only a conflict in the sense that if I owned a private uh, company, uh, all my companies I invest in are publicly traded, and most of them are here in Colorado, or a lot of them are, via the Canadian Stock Exchange. So uh, outside of that, I don't see any conflict um, that would be an issue for me to be on the council. And if there was one, I'm in a business as a fiduciary, as an investment advisor, I have to disclose everything you know, to the state. So I'm very used to that kind of model. Um, I think that answers your question. Uh, Barbara. I've actually met with two members of the Ethics Commission uh, separately because I wanted to learn what they did, how it impacted city council and the, the staff. And yes, there are potential areas where I could have a conflict of interest. I own rental, pro my husband and I own rental property. If there was an effort to change the land use code in some way that would benefit me, I need to step aside. Because uh, even if it's, you can say, well, it's gonna benefit more than just you, it's gonna benefit the whole community. If I have a financial gain, I have to step aside. Because one, you don't want any hint of, um, gain for service on the, the city council. You want to make certain that people view you as uh, above board, as uh, transparent, accountable, and um, an honest broker. Thank you. And Marcos? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it's an interesting question for, you know, the, the business I own, 11th Street Station, it's downtown Durango. Uh, what, what's difficult, yeah, I, I'd have to report to the Ethics Committee on, on a lot of my issues. Um, not only that, it's just I'm, I'm too unfamiliar. I, my, my business is too involved and ingrained in our community and the growth that it brings and the way it, you know, is, is, is affect, I mean, the way it has an effect on sales tax revenue. Um, I'd have to report to an ethics committee to understand where I truly lie with an issue that's brought to us. And Kim. Thank you. Um, so this isn't the first time this has been asked in a forum, which is really fun. Um, so I don't own any property, but my husband and I own our house here in town, and I do not have a business here in town. However, my husband is very active in the community, serves on several boards, and does um, advising for small and growing companies in our community that employ people. And I can imagine that there may be a situation where some group that he was advising with or was on the board would have... 
an issue that would come to city council and I may have to recuse myself from those conversations. All right, thank you. And so we now go to our close. You each have a one, one minute to make a closing statement and we will start with Marcos. Okay. Um, again, thank you know, thank all you for you know coming here tonight and listening to us, as well as the viewers and the League of Women Voters for putting this event on for us and our council or our candidates for the council spot. It's not an easy position. It's selfless and it takes a lot to put yourself out there. And I think a lot of us have some great ideas to bring to the table. On that note. What I want and what I'd like people to at least walk away with is, is, is I am, I, I'm, I'm there with Jamie. I'm a champion for small business. I'm there for the community. I'm born and raised here. And I'm someone that wants to not only, you know, not, I, I want to support everyone, but I'd love to engage a younger demographic in our community to participate on these sort of issues, to have a voice with our community and understand the long-term process that these sort of policy-making decisions have on our future 15, 20, 30 years from now. I'm looking at being here for 30, 40 years. That's what I'm planning on. So, am I. so let's, <laughs> let's think long-term. <laughs> um, and and, and that's, that's what I really hope to bring to the council. And, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Jamie? Thank you again for having me. It's great to see you all here participating in this democracy. and. Um, uh, like Marcos, I own a business, so I, I think what I look for every day, just probably like a lot of people, is I want new customers. I want us to be so busy with new customers, we don't have anything else, we can't have time to do anything else. Um, and that's what I enjoy. I like, I like being in business, but at the same time, I understand there's some real concrete issues. Um, one of those I quickly didn't mention during this was available housing, which I distinguish between affordable housing. Some great ideas come up about the ADUs. They're not enough being permitted. They cost too much to build. Another person suggested more manufacturing homes and more apartments. So I'm interested in available housing versus affordable housing from that perspective. And all I can say is my business career, my military career, everything I've done in life, nothing's been given to me. I work for it and I get up with a smile on my face and I, I really believe in being a happy warrior. That's what I enjoy. So that's, if you're looking for that kind of a person on your council, I'm your person, I'm your guy. Yeah, thank you. Kim? Going back to the opening, I wanna say that, that I love the character of this community, the multi-generational um, community, the, Challenges there are good paying jobs, so we're talking economic development, we're talking small and mid-sized mid companies. We have several wonderful um, entrepreneur generator companies here, Scape, Fort Lewis College, and we have numerous wonderful businesses that have come out of that and also been brought forth by our own residents. But we need to bring more businesses here, we need to have better paying jobs, we need to focus on how do we keep an aff affordable stream of housing coming in so so that people can come back here and live, so our seniors can live here, our kids can live here, and we have to figure out how the city um, does a better and more effective job of maintaining our basic services so that when we come down the road, we don't have broken pipes and broken streets, but we have a, a culture that creates a quality of life that we all really enjoy. And Barbara. Uh, thank you also for coming out and hearing all the candidates and appreciation to every candidate. I always say I'm not running against anyone, I'm running for city council. And I also want to thank those who've served before me. Experience matters. It matters a lot. And I have lived in the West in small towns and I've lived in big cities. I have 30 years of working in complex organizations where I've had to make very difficult decisions that affected people's lives. I've also worked in rural communities in Sub-Saharan Africa where we had to prioritize what do we need, what do we want, and how can we bring in the public private sector to attain that and put it into the government budget so it's sustainable. And what I found is that I think what we all want in this community is a vibrant community where your kids can live here if they want. There's affordable housing, there's jobs, and we can come together as a community and listen to each other's views as even though they may differ and recognize that compromise is what builds community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, and our audience that's both here and on television and perhaps online, I'd really like to thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, uh, your participation tonight is really important and, and 
uh, has meant a lot to us, but also your interest in serving the citizens of Durango. So we thank you for that. Um, also like to thank the audience for being here tonight and for your attention and for your very good questions. Um, I just want to remind you to remember to vote. Um, all completed ballots must be received by the Durango City Clerk's Office by 7 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday, April 2nd. Return envelopes containing ballots must bear the signature of the voter. Completed ballots must be returned by either putting a stamp, a 55 cent stamp, um, on your return um, envelope that came with your ballot, or by delivering the ballot in its completed return envelope to the city clerk's office in City Hall, at the county clerk and recorder's office in Bodo Park, or by depositing it um, directly into their 24-hour ballot box there, um, or at the La Plata County Administration Building at 1101 uh, East 2nd Avenue, where they also have a 24-hour deposit uh, box that you can use. There will be one polling place um, available to voters wishing to cast their ballot in person. It will be located at, in the city clerk's office at 949 2nd Avenue and will be open from 8 until 4 daily weekends excluded between March 18th and Monday, April 1st. On election day, April 2nd, the polling location will be available to voters from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. So again, thank you for joining us tonight and thank you very much candidates for being here.